Testament book of Ruth, and it's titled Faithful to Me. And I'm really pumped about this message series, you know, because I think there are, a, um, there are a handful of, maybe a handful of books in the Bible that I read much early on in life that I really didn't understand, only to discover later on after going to school and studying a little bit more, only to come back, read them, and discover that they had a whole wealth of wisdom and treasures in them. Um, for instance, the book of Leviticus. Everyone, who's actually even read through Leviticus? All right, keep your hands up. Who understands what you read? How many of you guys understood what you read? All right, most of you guys, right? Well, Ruth was one of those books for me, right? I just, I read through it, didn't really get it. But recently I came back to it and I'm like, holy cow, this book is an incredible love story. I, I never saw that before. I, I had a different opinion about Ruth based on my partial reading of it. I thought she was kind of sleeping around. And I went back to it and I'm like, oh my goodness, this woman is phenomenal. I mean, the way, like two main characters you meet in the book, a, a, a woman named Ruth, a man named Boaz, and the way that they meet and hook up and start a relationship, I mean, their story is the stuff that epic love stories are made of. And if you're single and you're asking God or trusting God to lead you to the one, you will find yourself praying at every verse, Lord, let this be my story. This book is that good. This story is that good. But not only is the book of Ruth a love story, it's also a God story. It really is. In it, we find God rewarding faithfulness. We find God working through pain, working through loneliness and heartache. We find him orchestrating events in people's lives in the book of Ruth so that it works out for their good and to God's glory. This book is one of the few books in the Bible or few stories that we can actually genuinely say that by the end of it, everyone actually lives happily ever after. Not a lot of stories in the Old Testament carry that, but this one does. And so whether you're single tonight or you're dating or you're married or your status on Facebook says it's complicated, this <laughs> message is for you. Okay, I don't know what that means yet. This message is for you. And, and I'm telling you, I, I'm hoping that um, ultimately I'm praying that, you know, you end up growing and uh, meeting the one. But, but um, my desire is that it would help you grow in godliness. We've always said that at, at Grace Church, our goal at Grace Church is to raise up a generation of families that are built to last. And our part of that vision is to help prepare each one of you guys to engage in healthy relationships at every level of your lives. We, we trust that you're going to come through us, and when it's time, God's going to move you on to other things. When you leave us, we want to make sure that we've prepared you, and we're sending you off better than when you came in. And so with this series, I'm hoping this accomplishes that. Now, let me launch us into part one tonight. And to launch us into tonight's story, I got to tell you the story or, or share really quickly um, the story of one woman who I think exemplifies the main point of tonight's message. How many of you guys have ever heard of Ted Haggard? Okay, some of you guys have. Well, Gail Haggard in November 2006 was the wife, is the wife of megachurch pastor Ted Haggard. And on November 2006, that morning, she found out on national TV that her husband, a megachurch pastor, had been having an affair with a male prostitute. Along with that accusation, the male escort who outed him on national radio or on radio, public radio, um, also admitted that along with having an affair with him, he also bought drugs that they used together. Now, that is obviously shocking news and, and devastating news for any woman to hear. But what I think makes this story at the time even worse was the fact that he had initially denied those charges on TV, only to admit it a few days later on camera in his car on TV. That image with him in the car was actually when he admitted next to his wife without her knowledge that he had in fact had this affair really, really tragic. And I remember watching that night, and you know what? I wasn't even, my mind wasn't even going towards judgmental. I felt deeply sorry for him. I really did, especially, especially his wife who had to bear this great shame with him. Tragic story, right? And I remember watching it that night, and I was thinking to myself, man, I mean, she's all, I mean, on the interview, she was cool, collected. And I remember thinking, she is going to give him hell when they get home. But, but more than that, I remember thinking to myself, man, I give her 24 hours. She's packing her bag. She's out of that marriage. Like within a week, she's done with him. I mean, why would you stay? Why would you stay? Why, why would you be there? 
But here's what's incredible. Gail Haggard did not leave her husband, Ted. In fact, it's been four years since that event, and by God's grace, they are still living together, they are still married, and they're going through therapy together to work through their struggles. Now, I, I say that not to kind of paint this happy where everything was happy. I mean, they're, they're, it was tough. It was tough. It hasn't been easy, but they as a couple have chosen to do the incredible or incredibly difficult task of working through their marriage, and that's been very hard. In fact, during that period, Gail Haggard wrote a book titled Why I Stayed. Highly recommended. Highly recommended. Great book. And in it, let me read a couple of things she says in an interview about those days when she found out about her husband's affair. Here's what she said. She says, I, I knew in that moment that I was going to have to make a choice early on, early on. I was going to have to make a choice as to what I was going to do. And I chose early on that I really do love this man. And, and here it is. And I'm willing to fight with him for our marriage and our family. When she was asked to sum up why it is that she chose to stay despite what he did, here's what she said. She said, I stayed because I believe in the teachings of Jesus Christ. That if we choose forgiveness and love, our relationship can and will heal. Now, there's no doubt in anyone's mind hearing this that she's an extraordinary woman. I mean, this, this woman is to be admired. God bless her heart. But as much as I admire her, a scary thought hit me this week. And here's the thought. I thought, had Gail Haggard been one of our peers, she was a 20-something, and she had come to us during this period for advice, asked Christians on what to do, most of us would probably have counseled her to seek a divorce. And we would have had Bible passages to back up our, our advice to her. We would have quoted all kinds of scripture passages. And she had every basis to get a divorce, right? I, I, think about it. A lot of us break off simple commitments in our lives for reasons less worse than that. Marriages break up today for reasons less worse than that. So, so I think starting off in tonight's message, I realize it's a little heavy, um, I, I think that you and I would agree that Gail Haggard's willingness to follow through on a marriage despite his betrayal says a lot about her godly character. And you know what? That's, that's what I really want to focus in on tonight. At least that's, where I'm, that's what I'm trying to pull out the story. Her, her character, especially as we look at chapter 1 of the book of Ruth tonight. Because in chapter 1 of the book of Ruth, we're going to find out that, Ruman, uh, that <laughs> woman, Ruth is a woman who not only finishes what she begins, but she follows through on her commitment even when popular wisdom gives her every reason, every excuse not to. And my hope is that as we look at Ruth's life through this series, as we look at her life and her action, you would use her as a role model and a standard of how faithfully you see through every commitment in your life, especially when God moves you into a marriage. That you would hold as a, yes, I'm going to be like that. Ultimately, you want to be like Christ, but she exemplified that pre-Christ. So, let's go into the book of Ruth, and let's talk about going all the way when it comes to your commitments, seeing things through to the end. If you have a Bible, look for the book of Ruth. It's a little hard to find. It is in the Bible someplace, right? What's that? After Judges. After, I was, there you go, Frank. After Judges, I knew that. It's after Judges, if you don't know where Judges is, what? <laughs> it's right after Joshua. And if you don't know where Joshua is, it's, just keep working your way there until you find Ruth, okay? I'm going to work in chapter one tonight. So let me read to you the first five verses as some of you guys are looking for that. Phenomenal story. You're going to love this story. All right. Starts off by saying that in the days when judges ruled Israel, there was a great famine in the land. And a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and his two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's na name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon, 
Malon, and Kilion. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Verse 3. Now Elimelech, who was Naomi's, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. And they married Moabite women, one named Orpah, Orpah and the other named Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Now, this is a tragic way to kind of start a story, right? You know, I said it's a love story, and you're like, dude, what's up with this beginning? It's quite a tragic story. I mean, this woman, Naomi, who really, the book should be named after her because she's sort of kind of a recurring name throughout the whole story, but it's called Ruth. This woman, Naomi, is basically, here's her story. She's forced out of her home because of famine, starvation. A little while after that, she loses her husband. Ten years after that, her two sons died, and she has no grandchildren to show for it. <laughs> By the time we get to verse 20 of this book, she gets so upset at God that she changes her name. She comes up with a new nickname. Instead of Naomi, she says, Starts calling me, she says, start calling me Mara, which basically means bitter. But I think the story is even begins a little bit more tragic than that. Now, I know I started tonight kind of heavy. It's going to get better, okay? So stick with me. Um, this story starts a little bit worse than that. It actually doesn't start in the book of Ruth. This story starts in the book of Judges, which is the book before the book of Ruth. If you look at the last verse of the book before the book of Ruth, that's the book of Judges. So you'd be looking at verse 25 of chapter 21 of the book of Judges, right? It's the last book before Ruth. The last verse in that book prior to this book says this. It says, and in those days, that's the days of the judges in Israel, Israel had no king. And everyone did as he saw fit, or your version might say, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So that's our context. And that sets up our story, and that tells us that already at chapter 1, verse 1, something is seriously wrong in this story. This was a very dark time in the land of Israel. And it was almost certain that the starvation and the famine that the Israelites were experiencing was a result of God's judgment. It wasn't some accidental happening. This, it really was a really gloomy cycle, right? If you read through the book of Judges, basically what would happen is that they never followed through on their commitment. They were very shallow people, just as some of us are today. So here's what would happen. They would come to God and say, God, we worship you, we love you, and, and God would bless them. But then after kind of they done, you know, hanging out with God, they would switch over to the local deities, to the local gods, and they would worship them. God would get angry, send invading armies to get them to come to their senses, they would suffer for a while, then ask God for forgiveness, and God would forgive them, but they would do it all over again. And constantly through the book of Judges, God, sin, repentance, back to God, sin over and over and over. It was this weird, constant cycle. When we get to the book of Ruth, they are in one of their down cycles. They've sinned. And it's in one of those down cycles that we read that Elimelech took his two sons and his wife to the country of Moab. Now, um, it might seem from one perspective that Elimelech was being wise, right? I mean, after all, there's starvation, there's famine. So he takes his family to another land to go find food. But if, if you are familiar with Old Testament stories, when you hear the name Moab, you should have all kinds of red flags going on. You don't want, you, you're like, the reader is almost inclined to say, no. Don't go to Moab. Bad. But don't go there. Moab is not good. And the reason Moab is a really bad place is because they were longtime enemies of Israel. According to Numbers chapter 25, the book of Numbers chapter 25, it, there's a whole story there where you meet a guy named uh, Balaam and, and he tries to curse God's people, but he can't. Anyway, in that story in 25, basically the Moabites had lured pe God's people. They had basically brought God's people along to from worshiping God to worshiping their local deity called Chemosh. And so God has it out for this nation. He does not like them. They are not cool. And so Elimelech has taken his family to the wrong place at the wrong time. Well, it doesn't take too long for him to suffer the consequences of his actions because within the span of 15 years, maybe 20 years, both he and his two sons are dead. And Naomi is left alone in a strange land as a widow. 
Actually, she's not quite alone because she, before her sons died, they married two Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. You got to know how hard I worked not to call her Oprah. <laughs> Orpah, not Oprah. All right. Orpah and Ruth. Now, so, so it's a love story, right? It starts kind of hard. It's a love story. So in light of the fact that it's a love story and in light of Elimelech's action, I have to ask us this question. And here it is. Um, so so I, I do some introspection here. Um, what relationships are you currently in that are out of God's will? Now, I think this question applies to every relationship you have in your life, whether it's business or relational, but I think I have more specifically in mind the pursuit of a dating relationship. So, so if you are in a relationship, um, is it Christ-approved? Here's what I mean by that. Are you both committed followers of Jesus Christ? I'm not talking about if they wear the label Christian. Like, is there an intentional desire for each one of you guys to want to know God? Because Scripture is clear about being unequally yoked. You should be in a relationship with other committed followers of Christ. Are you a committed follower of Jesus Christ? Are you male and female as opposed to same-gender relationships? All right, let's be clear what the Scripture says about homosexuality. Scripture never speaks about it in a positive, embracing light. Are you honoring God in that relationship? Are you honoring sexual boundaries until marriage? Here's a good question. Is the community of faith around you who are aware of your relationship, are they giving you a thumbs up, affirming what God is doing in your life in this relationship? Or have they raised up so many red flags that you've just said no? And you've given them the God speech. Maybe you're not dating. Maybe you are married. Here's a tougher question. Are there innocent friendships with someone of the opposite sex? Or do you have friendships with people like that that might slowly be evolving into an affair? It's happened. Maybe you're single. Question still applies. What kind of places have you been going to to search for the one? whether online or in the real world? Like, like, what kind of places are you going to go look? Like, like have you been hanging out at Moab? All right, because Moab, whatever Moab is for you, you got to figure that out. Or, or are, you, are you staying in the land alongside with other believers, trusting God to do his work in your life? Tell you what, in light of Elimelech's action, it is vital that you and I are attentive to the kinds of places where we go searching for God's will. You really need to be. God is patient. He's gracious. He'll work with us. But you need to check yourself before you wreck yourself. I couldn't, I couldn't resist that. Now, um, Elimelech and his sons are out of the picture, right? But God is still going to fulfill his part of the deal. He's still going to hold up his end of the bargain by providing for Naomi. She's an Israelite. She belongs to him. She's an Israelite. She's God's people. And, and, and really, it's at this part in the story where our heroine, Ruth, comes in. Here's where we really get to see Ruth. Now, the first indication that God is going to turn the story around and actually provide for those who seek him and stay committed to him is in verse 6. Look at verse 6. Because in verse 6, all of a sudden, God is now blessing the very land that Elimelech had abandoned because of famine. Remember, he left there because there was a need, because he thought, well, God's not providing. I'm going to go here and go look for this. When, in fact, had he stayed faithfully where God called him, God would have met him there. All right, just keep that in mind. As if, if, if you've gone to the wrong places to go seek out God's will for your life, in fact, God very well could meet you had you stayed. Elimelech made that mistake. And so all of a sudden, in Israel, rain begins to fall, crops begin to flourish as God sends down rain from heaven. So things are better in Israel. And so Naomi, who's still in Moab, comes to her senses and realizes that she's not supposed to be in Moab. And so she packs up her bag, heads back to Israel, but there's just one small problem. And here's the problem. She has two daughter-in-laws. A little bit of a problem. That she's now responsible for. At least she feels responsible for them. Their husbands are dead. 
Let me read it to you, starting in verse 6. This is Naomi. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home to Israel from there. Verse 7. With her two daughter-in-laws, she left a place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take her back to the land of Judah in Israel. Then Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, Go back. Each of you, go back to your mother's home, and may the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord, in fact, grant that each one of you will find rest in the home of another husband. And then she kissed them, and she wept aloud. I'm sorry, and, and then she kissed them, and they wept aloud, and they said to her, we will go back with you to your people. Verse 11, but Naomi told them, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who couldn't become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. And even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and they gave birth to sons, what, are you going to stay around until they grow up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. And at this they wept again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. Now, there's a strange statement in verse 11 and 12 that I probably need to explain. Because Ruth talks about, I'm sorry, Naomi talks about them marrying her unborn kids. And it, like that's, let me flesh that out for you. Um, according to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 25, verse, uh, chapter 25, I think it's uh, verse 5. One through six, that's right, I have it here differently. Um, according to that custom, when a husband died, um, it was a brother or near relative's, relative's responsibility to marry the widow. Right? They were very, obviously a very caring community. It was the responsibility of the brother to marry the widow so he could provide for her and hold up the family name so that he just didn't disappear off the face of the planet. And so that's what Naomi's referring to when she tries to release her daughter-in-laws from their marriage vows. Now, I want you to consider this offer from the perspective of the two women. These two women, Orpah and Ruth, were very likely at a still young, at a young age where they could still remarry. Their husbands were dead. They hadn't had any kids, which made it even more tempting. I mean, they could leave now, start afresh with some wealthy Moabite dude. And they could leave now, everything would be okay. Matter of fact, to make the offer even more tempting, Naomi basically says go, and in and, and telling them to go, Naomi paints this very bleak future of what it would look like if they chose to stay with her. First of all, she, she makes the point, uh, uh, um, first of all, if they came with her, they might as well kiss any goodbye, any chance of ever finding a man, because if she got married and had kids, the women would be too old to marry those kids anyway. So she was basically saying, listen, if you come with me, you're coming with loneliness, heartache, and no husband. Why are you coming with me? To further discourage them, she says in verse 13, she says, God has forsaken me. He killed my husbands. I got no grandkids. If you come with me, you might receive some of his judgment too. She even prays for them, says, go. Verse 8, may God bless you. May God give you a hot husband. May he give you a home. May you, like she prays, releases them, says, go. <coughs> Leave now while you can. Now, since Ruth is our main focus, let's look at this story from her angle. Now, both Ruth and or Orpah had agreed in verse 10 that no matter what happened, they would remain faithful to their mother-in-law. Remember that? Verse 10, they said, no, we're going to go with you. They had made a commitment, we're going to stay with you. They had made a pact, we're going to stay with you. But after Naomi starts to paint a miserable picture of the future, um, Orpah started to have second thoughts. She's counting her cost. Orpah's hearing Ruth say, if I... Um, Orpah is hearing Naomi say, if you come with me, ain't nothing in this for you. And Orpah is probably starting to wrestle in her heart. Why, why stay on a sinking ship? Ain't nothing here for me. Why not go now while the offer is still legit? And by verse 14, she puts her thoughts to action and decides that this life of singleness is not for her. And so she leaves Naomi and goes back to her family to go find her husband. Now, let me just say this. Um, there's no shame in what Orpah did. All right, so we're not, we're not putting her to shame. We're not, all right, 
Ruth basically prayed for her and said, you can go. There's no shame in it. She simply counted her cost and decided that she didn't want to spend the rest of her life being a spinster. Now, okay, so, so that's the background. Put yourself in Ruth's shoes at this point. All right, so you're Ruth. If Ruth had any hope that she would at least find a friend to help her through the lonely times, it was gone the moment Orpah walked out the door. So choosing to go with Naomi was a very tough thing. She was giving up the hope of ever getting married, the hope of having a successful future. She was giving that up. Now, my temptation when I was preparing this message was to ask you guys this question. And the question is, is how many of you would be willing to do what Ruth did for Naomi? That was what I was going to ask you. But I'm not going to ask you that. And I'm not going to ask you because in my experience, I have not yet met a 20-something-year-old who has a desire for marriage who'd be willing to give up their future, a future like that. Perhaps you exist, but I haven't met one yet. So instead of that question, here's what I want to ask you. And I think this is a more relevant question in light of what happened. Here it is. Um, How are you at finishing what you begin? How well do you finish? Or ask another way, how high or how low is your batting average on following through to the end your commitments? Let's look at a couple of areas in your life. How committed have you been and are you to relationships in your life? Do you have a tendency to jump from one relationship into another, depending on how in love you're feeling or how uninteresting the relationships get? How's the relationship level at your life? How committed are you to your job, specifically when it's not going as you would like it to go? Like, do you jump from one job to another depending on how much money they're offering you or who you get to work with? Is that your thing? What's next? What's next? What about church? How committed to you or how committed are you to a local body of believers? Like do you, do you are you a church hopper? Do you hop from one church to another depending on whom you meet or what they're teaching, what kind of worship they have? What about something as simple as a word of promise? Like whether it's verbal or written, are you a man or a woman who sees through to the end your commitments? Do you finish what you begin? It's an important question to ask as a young adult. And whatever it is that you're answering in your mind right now says a lot about your character. Says a lot about the kind of man or the kind of woman that you are. The answer to that question also says a lot about, or or the answer to that question, at least series of questions I just asked you, might also be an interesting indicator as to why you are where you are in life today. Perhaps you've prayed that and said, God, why is it I cannot move to the next stage? Whether it's a job, whether it's a marriage, like, like, okay, where you are today might be as a result of your Ability to see through to the end the things that have already been entrusted to you in the past. And you might never have considered this, but your ability to follow through to the end, even in the smallest assignments and even in the most, what you perceive as an insignificant relationship, has a huge influence on what God's going to entrust to you in days to come. Huge, strong, powerful correlation between how faithful you are and what God's going to entrust you. There are a number of Bible passages that have convinced me of this, including the one where Jesus Christ talks about, um, he he assures us that those who are faithful in little things will be what? Entrusted with greater things. But, But there's another Bible passage that I think really drove this home for me. And it's in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 11 to 12. It's on the screen, and I think I'm reading the um, Today's Living Bible translation. But here's what it says. Listen to this, okay? So if you're asking that, Lord, what's next? Lord, lead me. Listen to this. It says, everything, everything in the heavens and earth is yours, O Lord. This is your kingdom. We adore you as being in control of everything. Riches, 
honor come from you alone. And you are the ruler of all of mankind. Listen to this. Your hand, O oh God, controls power and might. And I love this part. This is where really God, it says, and God, it is at your discretion that men are made great and given strength. Think about the implications of that. It's at his discretion that men are made great and given strength. In light of the fact that he owns everything, including your dream job, he owns it. Uh, your dream, the one, he owns her or him. Like your dream, anything, he owns it. And it's at his discretion that he gives it freely. Your ability to follow through on your current commitments in your life right now does not and will not pass the attention of God. He's attentive to it. And arguably, your ability to, to see through your current commitments influences his decision on what kind of doors of opportunities and relationships will open up in your life. Are you with me on that? And I think Ruth understood this. Ruth understood that there was a strong correlation between my faithfulness here with what God's going to entrust me in the days to come. She wasn't, you know, when we read about her, she's hearing all these things about Naomi, and she says, I'm going to go with you. Most of us are like, wow, what a stupid girl. That's not smart. That's a sinking ship. <laughs> Ruth was smart. She was brilliant. She wasn't making a brash decision. Here's why I suggest that. In the early part of verse 1, it tells us that her husband and her were married for 10 years. And so her husband was an Israelite. There's every reason to believe that during those 10 years before her husband died, her husband told her about the God of Israel. Remember, she was a pagan. But during her marriage, very likely her husband would have told her about God's faithfulness to bring out his people from Egypt. Her husband would have told her stories about God doing miracles and bringing people through Moses, crossing the Red Sea. Her husband had probably taught her about Joshua and, and Jericho and how God used him to bring her through. And her husband had taught her about God's faithfulness. By the time her husband died, Ruth had learned enough about God's faithfulness and had already made the choice in her heart that she's going to pick the God over Israel, the God of Israel over the God of her local community. Uh, you seen her thinking? She'd made this commitment to God long before her husband died. And so when we read that Ruth clung on to Naomi despite the promise of absolutely nothing in return, don't make the mistake of thinking she was foolish. Ruth, her decision was brilliant. Her faith and her hope wasn't in Naomi's circumstance. It was in God that Naomi served. Ruth was trusting in her God that if she went with Naomi, Naomi's God would care for her. She had put two and two together, and based on the stories about God of Israel, had chosen that she would rather stick with God than her local God, Chemosh. By the way, that was the same wise decision that a prostitute named Rahab made a few books earlier. Story of Rahab, the Israelites come to, I think it was Jericho, they were trying to invade Jericho, and Rahab says, I'm with your God. And I think, I think it, it's no wonder that in the book of Matthew chapter 1, when it mentions the genealogy of Jesus Christ, there are three women mentioned there. Um, the, first, the third one, I think, is a woman named Tamar. The other two, guess what their names are? Ruth and Rahab. <laughs> Faithful women who followed through on their commitments. Let me read to you Ruth's reasoning as she convinces Naomi that she ain't going nowhere. I'm sticking with you, lady. Ruth, verse 16, says this. She says, don't urge me to leave you, Naomi, or to turn back from you. For where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Do you hear it? This woman knew about the God of Israel. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I'm going to die. And there I'm going to be buried. And may the Lord deal with me ever so severely if anything but death separates me and you. And with that, Naomi figured, all right, well, I'm just going to let you come with me then. I love Ruth's commitment. Guys, if by God's grace, God leads you to a Christian woman who has this kind of level of commitment to God and to you, you need to drop 
everything and do whatever it takes to win her heart. You hearing me, fellas? Find a woman who will say whether your dreams for our future comes true or not, I'm in it 100% with you till death do us apart. Now, I don't want to paint this picture of, ooh, romance, and it's never going to get hard. Yeah, it's going to get hard. It is going to get hard, and you're going to have days where she's going to look at you and say, really? I married you? I'm speaking from experience. I'm just saying. <laughs> it's never happened in my home. <laughs> you know, um, you know marriage, is not about, marriage is not about feeling in love. I think I thought that. It's about commitment. It really isn't. Because uh, feeling in love lasts, for some of you guys, you can probably stretch it a year and a half after your marriage. And then you're like, oh, okay, we got to figure this out. Marriage is not about feeling in love. It's about commitment. It's about choosing that no matter what happens, I'm in this 100%. And you wouldn't know what's going to happen. No one ever goes into marriage thinking, well, we're going to end up with this much problems. But when it happens, because you are accustomed, because as a single you've, you've developed a habit of seeing through to the end your commitments, it really is a big step in helping you see through to the end your marriage commitment. Now, some people might say, well, Ruth wasn't really married. I mean, that's different. But I would argue if she could stay committed to Naomi despite Naomi's attitude, I think she can make it in marriage. And think about what Ruth did here, right? Like she, she, she went all in. She knew what was at stake, and she went all in. And you know what? Here's what's incredible about the story. Here's the fun part. God rewarded her greatly. Like God rewarded her faithfulness above and beyond what she could expect. In fact, God's rewards to her was so great that she would become the great-grandmother of King David. It's not bad. Greatest king in Israel. She was a great grandmother. Now, in the next few messages through this message series, we'll talk in detail about how God orchestrated her rewards because the rest of the book is basically God just rewarding her. And we'll talk about that in the next few messages. But let me just kind of lay it out for you what she received. Uh, we already know that she was the great grandmother of David from whose bloodline would come Jesus, right? Greatest gift ever. I think that enough is, is huge. But there's a couple of more, right? Be because this is a love story, we know that God is going to bless her, not just with a boyfriend, but with a lifelong companion. God's going to bless her with a husband, a man of honor, a man of dignity named Boaz. Ladies, you're going to love this dude. You're going to love him. He's a man. We'll meet him next week. Fellas, please come. <laughs> no, you're thinking, oh, I ain't coming next week. But even before that, God blessing, the relationship blessing. I think there are a few immediate rewards that we begin to see right upon their arrival back in Israel. So at this point in the story, Ruth has decided, Naomi, I'm sticking with you no matter what happens. They both travel back to Israel. Upon their arrival, God begins to shower down blessings. Let me ask you this. When they left Israel, do you remember what the conditions were? Famine, right? Starvation. On the day of their arrival back in Israel, verse 22 says what? So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth, the Moabite, Tess, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as what? The barley harvest was beginning. <laughs> Sign of greater things to come. They came back to the land at a time when they, the land was in celebration because God was favorably smiling on them by providing an abundance of food, which I would argue is a symbolic picture of the harvest of blessing that God's about to bring in this woman's life. And so not only is God giving her long-term spiritual blessing, not only has she gotten something immediate in her husband, but the community around her is experiencing a blessing. Maybe not necessarily because of her, but at the time she returns to it, God's blessing the land. Now, I think what's incredible in this story is that the tide is changing. I mean, things are shifting. God is about to start blessing them, but Naomi is still so focused on what she doesn't have that she spends all of verse 22 to 21 whining. In fact, she comes up with a new nickname. Don't call me Naomi, which, by the way, means pleasant. I don't know if you know that. Naomi means pleasant or beautiful. She's like, don't call me that. Call me bitter. How's that for a nickname? And, you know, it's at that point you want to sing to her, uh, give me your eyes for just one second. Give me your eyes so I can see. All right? 
Like, open your eyes, lady. God's doing something new. Or, or, or here's this song. You want to sing to her, greater things are yet to come, right? Open your eyes. So let me ask you this. What, what dreams and what ambitions, what desires fill your heart tonight? Like, as you think about your prayers over the last year, what, what recurring, because we all have recurring prayers. What are your recurring prayers? Because what, what, your recurring prayers is really your dreams. It's, it's your ambition. It's your desire. It's what probably drives you. And you know what? I, I've worked long enough with young adults. Sorry, maybe five years. But I've worked a lot, long enough and known young adults long enough to know that at this stage in most young adults' life, though there are many prayers that they're praying for, one recurring prayer is the desire for a spouse. I could be wrong, but most young adults that I've met are generally praying for that. And you know what? That's okay. It's a legit prayer. Totally legit. However, is it possible that the answer to those <coughs> recurring prayers is closely linked to your faithfulness in seeing through the things that God has currently entrusted you with? I don't care how simple, how insignificant you consider them. What commitments in your life have you not followed through on? And, and, and is that your MO? Is that you? Are you, do this job a little, I'm done with it, next one. Date this person a little, I'm done with this, next one. Be a part of this group, I'm done with this, move on. Like, is that just your thing? To move on from relationship to relationship, to job to job, to people group to people group? E even in the secular world, that doesn't work to your advantage. How much more the spiritual context so my challenge to you tonight is this. Finish whatever it is you've begun, begun. Finish whatever it is you begin and see through to the end whatever you commit yourself to. Because God, who owns heaven and earth, is watching. And it's at his discretion that men and women are made great. It's at his discretion, the doors of opportunity will open in your life. Opportunities will open in your life. For when you begin seeing through to the end your commitments, you then stand back. And you watch how God orchestrates events in your life in such a way that it brings him the greatest glory and raises you to new heights as you experience blessings in your life for your faithfulness. So, finish whatever it is you begin. Let's pray.